Good afternoon and welcome everyone. It's wonderful to see so many people with us this afternoon. My name is Tony Erskine and I'm director of the Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs here at the Australian National University. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and celebrating the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, the first Australians from whose traditional lands I speak today and pay my respects to elders past and present. I would also like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the first Australians from whose traditional lands you are joining us across Australia. And one of the benefits of having this on Zoom is that we are able to have people involved from all over Australia and other parts of the world as well. The Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs and our Department of International Relations have a reputation for approaching global and regional affairs with a combination of academic rigor and ethical awareness. Our researchers are known for the positive contributions that they make beyond academia. And we've realized that we're able to have this impact because of vital and valued partnerships, partnerships such as the one that we have that we're really fortunate to have with the International Committee of the Red Cross. Such partnerships allow us to gauge in important and often difficult conversations on topics like the one today on sexual violence in armed conflict. It's a great pleasure to be able to introduce David Tuck, the new head of mission at ICRC Australia. David has truly come full circle. He is originally from Canberra and then worked with the International Committee of the Red Cross in Afghanistan, in Geneva, and in East Africa. And we're delighted to have him back in Canberra in this important role. David, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Erskine. Indeed, I, indeed I have come full circle. I had the pleasure of, of studying uh, at the Australian National University. A, a very good afternoon in, in Canberra, Port Moresby and, and the Highlands, a rather early uh, good morning uh, in Geneva. It is, it's really vital that we mark and commemorate the International Day for the Elimination of, of Violence Against Women. So thank you, all of our guests, for joining the Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs and, and us, the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, for this discussion and exchange on sexual violence in armed conflict. In broaching this topic, uh, we've really tried to put the emphasis on looking forward paths to recovery and thinking about proactive multidisciplinary engagement both of course in the academic space and very important to us in humanitarian action. Unfortunately it is always the right time to be having this discussion uh, and in particular COVID-19 and its consequences present or exacerbate certain risk factors for sexual and gender-based violence. In March of this year, and, and that already feels like really a lifetime ago, the then ICRC's initial analysis was that in this context, and, and I quote, women and adolescent girls will face heightened risks of sexual and gender-based violence and survivors will be at greater risk as a result of containment and quarantine since this form of violence, which is, and I emphasize, which is life-threatening, is most prevalent in the home. And certainly recognizing that, that COVID-19 has disproportionate effects on, on those at risk of sexual violence amongst other persons, our call at that time, and it remains very true today, was really for inclusive humanitarian and related programming, really prevention, protection and assistance that supports marginalized and at-risk populations. Of course, uh, the vulnerability or vulnerability and risk is exacerbated by a, a multiplicity or a multiplication of factors, including the broader humanitarian context. And with a mission to protect and assist victims of armed conflict, the ICRC is day in, day out, seriously concerned about sexual violence in many of the places in which we work. And let's recall at the outset that rape is a serious violation of the law applicable during armed conflict, and that's international humanitarian law and as criminalized is certainly a war crime. But if sexual violence uh, certainly does concern us during armed conflict, it must concern us wherever and whenever it is found. And as we will hear from my colleague Rebecca in Papua New Guinea or and in Papua New Guinea's highlands to be more precise, the ICRC is working on prevention, support following and response to sexual violence. All of this, the, the circumstances of the survivors and, and the humanitarian response itself is obviously complicated by the fact that sexual violence is largely unreported, certainly underreported, uh, 
and often unrecognized. It's true too that how we talk and think about sexual violence has real world consequences for the recovery of people affected by it. And that is very much the context of our discussion today. So please just let me express our, our sincere and great appreciation uh, to our moderator and her superb panel and to the Coral Bell School for the immense support that they have and they continue to provide to the ICRC on this and, and other pressing humanitarian concerns. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce our moderator. And that's Professor Bina De Costa of the Department of International Relations at the Bell School. And Professor De Costa's research interests span a range of re relevant and related topics and indeed precisely this issue sexual and gender-based violence in conflicts. Professor De Costa has provided input and technical advice to transitional justice processes, and she is the author of seven books, including Nation Building, Gender and War Crimes in South Asia. Who better, ultimately, to moderate our discussion? Professor De Costa, over to you. Thank you, David. Good afternoon, everyone. We welcome you to our event commemorating the International Day of the Elimination of Violence Against Women. This day also marks the launch of 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. This campaign calls for global actions to increase awareness, galvanize advocacy efforts, and share knowledge and innovations. In collaboration with the ICRC, from the Bell School, we are honored to present our special panel on sexual violence and armed conflict, paths to recovery. Just one housekeeping rule at the beginning, please could you keep your microphones muted unless you are engaging in a discussion during the Q&A. We have prepared a short video to introduce our subject matter. Kian, over to you first. Right. In our education, we always tell them to come to the hospital to access the service before 72 hours. There's a travel fight in the road, remote part. The road, the bridge, and the danger of the people who are involved. If they are from the other side, it's very hard for them to come to the services on this side. Thank you, Ken. We have three distinguished speakers today in our panel. I'll introduce to, the, uh, to them to you uh, in sequence. First, I'd like to request May Maloney, from, who is joining us from Geneva, to offer her intervention. May is a sexual violence advisor for ICRC based in Geneva. She has over a decade's experience addre addressing sexual and gender-based violence, gender and diversity, and social inclusion in the human rights, community development, torture and trauma, and humanitarian fields. May's work focuses on technical field support and leading the sexual, and she also leads the sexual violence team's humanitarian diplomacy priorities, operational research outcomes, and external relations. May is the winner of the 2018 Mary Fran Myers Gender in Disasters Award for her work spearheading a team of local female humanitarian actors across the Asia Pacific. May, I'm going to ask you three questions and I'd like to request you to respond to those um, in the 15 minutes that you have. The questions are, 
how does the icsc define sexual violence how is this different from the broader term sexual and gender based violence or even violence against women what is the icsc's approach to addressing the issue of sexual violence in the context where it works and what are the challenges going forward what more does icsc need to do to improve prevention and response to the issue of sexual violence over to you may thanks so much bina um, a great series of questions there um, and i think david has given uh, some introduction indeed to these themes and to the importance uh, which the icrc gives to addressing sexual violence around the world so as some of you listening online may know the work of the icrc is very much so based on um, the geneva conventions of 1949 their additional protocols its statutes and based on the work of the red cross red crescent movement so as an independent neutral humanitarian organization we work in situations of conflict uh, that might be international armed conflict or other situations of violence so non international armed conflict places where there are internal disturbances uh, or situations that warrant humanitarian actions and we as an icrc have a particular role to play in places of detention around the world and what we see in all of the activities that we do um, in delivering assistance and protection to communities and in terms of analyzing and contributing to international humanitarian law and its application is that sexual and gender based violence is hideously prevalent around the world i think that should come as no surprise to everyone on the line sexual and gender based violence is a leading cause of uh, premature death globally no matter the context for women and girls around the world um, it is a leading concern for police in terms of response to domestic violence call outs um, but what we see in particular and what we are very concerned about is that it's also hideously prevalent in terms of modern warfare and situations of conflict and it is this area in which we focus from where we we draw our particular um, focus on sexual violence in particular and i just want to clarify that sexual violence which i'll now tell you about and define from icrc's perspective is but one part of the broader picture of sexual and gender based violence more broadly so the sexual violence in conflict and other situations of violence the sexual violence that occurs in detention that we look at is also one part of wider sexual and gender based violence and so the definition i'll give you is is a somewhat legalistic one that comes from international humanitarian law but we also in our operations in our work in our assistance are aware of and, and can and indeed do respond to all of these many other forms of sexual and gender based violence that may not fall always directly within the definition that I'm giving you now. So sexual violence is defined in international humanitarian law and it's defined as sexual violence that's used in a situation of conflict or or other situations of violence that is to say the definition talks about where there is a nexus or a relationship between the sexual violence and the conflict or the, the the situation that it happens in so this definition includes the the key um, sexual violence in conflict that might come to your mind such as the tactical use of war or of, of sexual violence in warfare or or rape as a weapon of war but sexual violence in international humanitarian law also includes other types of sexual violence not just that is used strategically by weapons bearers but other types of sexual violence that might be used by authorities um, other types of sexual violence that can happen that might be more opportunistic sexual violence but that occurs in the general situation of conflict so for those of you who are focused on the law or studying the law or, or interested in these aspects of international relations I'll just extremely briefly let you know um, where that comes from in the law so several articles of the geneva conventions and their additional protocols prohibit sexual violence and in particular customary um, rule number 93 states that in conflict settings rape and other forms of sexual violence are prohibited 
in non-international armed conflict, that comes from Article 3 of the Additional Protocol 2 um, of the Geneva Conventions. And in international armed conflict, sexual violence is prohibited in the Third Geneva Convention, which provides protection to prisoners of war. So prisoners of war at all times should be protected from sexual violence. Um, and there are fundamental guarantees in Article 75 of um, Additional Protocol 2. I'm sorry to go into the law, but I think a few, a few people on the line might be interested in this for, for their research, um, which prohibits rape, enforced prostitution, and other forms of indecent assault in the Fourth Geneva Convention, which is specific to women and children. So basically, all of this to say that sexual violence, when it has a relationship with conflict, can include rape, gang rape, sexual slavery, enforced prostitution, forced pregnancy, enforced sterilization, and other uh, types of, of violence which constitute war crimes. Um, we also know that these can be used as part of a systematic attack on civilians. And, and when that's done, it constitutes a crime against humanity. And lastly, I think by the very nature of sexual violence and the fact that we know that it is predominantly women and girls that are targeted by this violence, what we also often um, see is that women's um, experience of this is targeted then because of their sexual and reproductive health um, capacities. And, uh, you know, the Geneva Conventions, as well as international law, um, in, make clear that um, such sexual violence can also constitute acts of genocide. Um, so we, when we talk about sexual violence, we're talking about um, these particularly um, uh, defined uh, issues, but we recognise that it doesn't end with a reading of international humanitarian law. And so all of these violations of the law also bear a relationship with human rights law. And gender-based violence more broadly, this broad umbrella term, which includes intimate partner and domestic violence, irrespective of the link to armed conflict, also can amount to torture, cruel, inhumane and degrading treatment, and therefore can violate human rights law and the conventions against torture. So, Acts of sexual violence, wherever they're committed, um, basically these um, constitute violations of international law. And, and we're very clear about that. Um, and what is important for us about this um, relationship also to international humanitarian law and to human rights law is that in situations of um, conflict and in all situations, there can be requirements that the wounded, the sick, um, including victim survivors of sexual violence, need medical care and that they get and receive that medical care without any hindrance. So if you take nothing more from this, it's that humanitarian law provides a specific reading of what sexual violence is and that human rights law prohibits that as well as things that fall under the wider umbrella of sexual and gender-based violence and that victims and survivors of sexual violence must have access to health care that they require without discrimination. That is life-saving. Um, and so I always feel very strange describing this from the experience of the law, from the definition of the law, because we know that, um, you know, the needs of survivors, the experience of survivors is not viewed through this prism. Um, so even in a context such as, um, COVID-19, it's important that we know that these laws exist, but what's more important is that we place survivors at the centre and we plan our services uh, in a way that they can access and, and receive the full spectrum of care, whether that's healthcare or legal aid, um, whether that's, uh, for example, mental health and psychosocial support, which we'll hear much more about from Rebecca's very inspiring work, or other um, areas like safety and protection needs. So sexual violence is one thing, sexual and gender-based violence is the umbrella it fits under. And violence against women is, of course, an incredibly important term um, that describes, I think, the experience of um, this type of violence being largely um, directed towards and experienced by women and girls. And it also points towards some of 
the root causes of these issues, which can be gender inequality and abuse of power. However, the ICRC doesn't use that term violence against women uh, because we, we um, are providing you know, support to all survivors in, in, a, in, a, in any setting that we're working in. Um, and in particular, because we have this access to and this, this role working in prisons and detention, these can be very male dominated spaces. And it means that oftentimes, um, just by the sheer proportion of, of people represented in some of the spaces we work in, the spaces we access, we see and we work with a lot of male survivors. So we recognize violence against women as a term, but just to clarify um, some of these distinctions in terminology, because it, it can become um, confusing, but all of these terms are of course interlinked. Um, just to turn now to your question about how we respond very briefly, um, we uh, respond to sexual violence in, um, in our operations, in our field facing work by taking a, a, a multidisciplinary approach and a survivor centered approach to, the, to addressing these issues. We have a strategy that is in place at the ICRC that says very clearly all teams, all people in the ICRC, all 16,000 of us have a role to play in preventing, mitigating the risk or responding to sexual and gender-based violence. So that means that um, in some contexts where we offer healthcare, our teams offer the clinical management of rape, um, critical care around the 72 hours after an incident of sexual violence, um, or we support local health actors and communities to implement that kind of care. We also, provide mental health and psychosocial support, which Rebecca will elaborate on. We also have a particular role in protection in communities, so protecting um, and interviewing and working with communities affected by conflict and understanding the patterns and trends um, around how IHL and the laws of war are in application and offering um, protection services to, to people in those contexts. And so we do that also by um, offering referral and support to victim survivors of this type of sexual violence, which means we often have to refer them out to other expert agencies and be part of this web of um, women's organisations, community-based actors, health and legal organisations that all work together to meet the needs of the victim survivors. Some things that we're doing a lot um, recently with the COVID uh, crisis is offering cash and voucher assistance, so direct money to victim survivors so that they can choose and, and, and continue to have agency on what they do with that money, whether they need it to access health, they might need it to access safe shelters, or they may need it because they have experienced social ostracism, been rejected from um, community or family land, um, and that they may have faced a loss of, of livelihood, of, of, of shelter protection, and, and, and therefore these cash um, injections um, help provide a, a range of responses for them. Um, our water and sanitation teams, they adapt their programming to make sure that, that people who are affected by um, sexual violence are consulted to make sure that where we put water and sanitation programming doesn't raise risk of exposure to sexual violence and our migration teams do this as well. They work with um, people on migratory routes to see where might opportunistic sexual violence happen, what is the community fearing about the, the, the flight routes and see if they can um, together work with communities on, on approaches for prevention and risk mitigation. As I mentioned, we, we, we do take um, a very particular role around disseminating the laws of war. And one thing that we do is we talk to weapons bearers, whether that's state militaries or non-state armed groups. We talk to them about how sexual violence is a war crime. And we um, provide them with some examples of best practice of how to adopt uh, new codes of conduct for the prevention of this, new, new sanctions um, for uh, people in their ranks, um, but also how to work towards uh, a shift in, in peer pressure and norms amongst armed groups to prevent sexual violence from happening in the first place. And um, just in terms of one example, um, in one country that we work um, particularly deeply on, on this issue, 
we've been engaged um, for, for more, than, more than five years with at least 25 non-state armed groups um, on this issue of sexual violence. And we've continued to have that access even during COVID times to those same 25 non-state armed groups. Um, so this, this is a very important aspect of the role we can have in prevention. But as I said, we need to work with others in the ecosystem to make sure that survivors receive all of these different um, forms of support services and we can't offer them all. And indeed, we're not expert in offering all of them. So it, it does mean partnerships are absolutely critical. Um, it can be very challenging to talk about this issue with detainees and enclosed environments like prisons. So I'll just touch on that, but that's one of the challenges in case people want to come back to it in the, in the questions. And going forward, um, what does ICRC need to do to improve? Well, we, we, we always need to do more to improve um, in this area, like in, in, in all areas, we strive to improve our protection. We strive um, to, to really emphasize with authorities that it, it is the role of states uh, to, to ensure an atmosphere and an environment for the prevention of sexual violence. Um, but we, we know that it's, it's communities that are key. And we've been working since 2018 to implement our own strategy on addressing sexual violence, to build the capacities of our people to respond sensitively, to know about survivor-centered principles. Um, and we've been building also the capacities of our teams to partner locally. And that's where the opportunity lies for the ICRC to build our partnerships with national societies of the Red Cross, Red Crescent, with community-based organizations, and with the affected populations that we work with so that we can better address the root causes and the really um, the big drivers of the negative impact. So stigma, inequality, um, issues of ostracism and really address and change the, change the story on sexual and gender-based violence. Thanks, Bina, and over to you. Thanks so much, May. That was so uh, useful to hear about the legal framework and also to think about how sexual violence and when we're talking about uh, sexual and gender-based violence and violence against women, how they all connect in terms of ICS's broader framework. Uh, and also what you mentioned that we need to emphasize uh, the survivor-centered approach. So here I'd like to bring in Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca PM uh, is a mental health and psychosocial support field officer with ICRC in Papua New Guinea. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree in counseling from Divine Word University in PNG and also a counseling diploma from Griffith University in Australia. Rebecca works directly with communities in the PNG Highlands to improve access to and the quality of mental health and psychosocial support and services. Rebecca, we are honored to have you. I have to, uh, also three questions for you, actually a little bit more than three, maybe a set of questions. So I'd like to pose those first to you uh, before your intervention. So the questions are, how widespread and what is the nature of the issue of sexual violence in the PNG Highlands? What work is the ICRC doing to respond to sexual violence and help people affected by it to recover? Can you give an example of the ICRC's work with a specific community in responding to sexual violence? Over to you, Rebecca. So thank you, Bina, and thank you, everybody. Um, firstly, um, the first question, how widespread is the issue of sexual violence in the PNG Islands? Um, as we all know from what David said, the issue of sexual violence is very widespread in the PNG Islands. Uh, monthly data and reports, statistics that we receive from the family support centers indicates that sexual violence is, affects everyone, regardless of the sex and age. Um, it is pervasive even in normal times in PNG, and often it goes underreported or not even reported at all. Uh, however, the one uh, sexual violence is often magnified um, during trouble fighting, um, and in the areas where ICRC works in the islands, I think um, our mandate here is to 
provide or work provide support to the humanitarian consequences of travel fighting. And often during and after travel fights, um, sexual violence is often magnified. Uh, for example, when there's uh, displacement from the fights, individuals are often more vulnerable to becoming victims of sexual violence. Um, also, when communities are displaced, um, they are accommodated by host communities in different locations and are often threatened, manipulated, and forced into um, sexual violence acts um, like rape, sexual assault, harassment, um, and even forced or underage marriages. Um, this very significant underreporting um, and even no reporting at all um, countrywide because I think there's not enough tools to capture the accurate data of sexual violence. Um, <clears throat> so the ICRC response to sexual violence and helping people to recover from it, the support that we provide. Um, for the MHPSS part, we, have, we provide um, two forms of support to the communities firstly, and um, to the health facilities where we work in. Um, in the communities, the, we provide ongoing awareness and sensitize, sensitization um, on the health and the MHPSS consequences of sexual violence, uh, especially information for them to go well, where to get support from in all the priority provinces where ICRC operates within the Upper Highlands area. Uh, also, there's engagement with men in the community on sexual violence. Um, we also um, reiterate the importance of seeking treatment um, and also the timely impact of receiving psychological and psychosocial uh, support. Uh, also, we have an engagement with uh, village birth attendants. Um, these are the trusted community women that we work in, the communities. Um, to help raise awareness in communities on the prevention of sexual violence and on the NHPSS consequences and the facilitation of referrals of victims to the services that are available within those provinces. Another point is that uh, we provide training to these village birth attendants to provide basic psychological support to um, all victims of violence. Um, but specifically, um, I mean, including sexual violence victims as well. And on top of that, um, we train this, uh, not train, but the selected, the selected village birth attendants that uh, we train them to provide support groups for victims of violence. So within each of the communities, the focus groups, um, they provide or they facilitate support group sessions. So that's the program that we have in the communities. Um, for the health facilities, um, <clears throat> we have provided um, extensive training and capacity building of family support center staff. Um, so the family support centers are centers located within provincial hospitals in the three provinces we work in. Um, in Papua New Guinea, there are 11 family support centers nationwide, but within the Hapa Islands, the three provinces, we also provide support to them. Um, so it's like a one-stop, the family support center is a one-stop shop where uh, survivors or victims of violence and especially uh, for sexual violence victims, um, they go there to seek medical and um, psychological treatment. Um, so we provide support to them so that they can provide quality MHPS services to the victims of sexual violence. So, some of the things that we do also is to provide um, the on, on, on the job coaching for them, for the staff, uh, as well as supervision and monitoring of the psychological support sessions that take place within the facility. Um, also <clears throat> for primary care staff, we train and supervise them to identify victims of sexual violence um, who are attending the facility and also providing basic psychological support and referral to relevant service providers. Um, also, this 
improvement of service delivery to the donation of items to the different facilities uh, to ensure that victims receive services in a dignified manner. Um, in addition, we provide transport reimbursement for victims of uh, sexual violence accessing services at the Family Support Center. So which means that victims can come in for review and follow up. And this encourages the victims to actually come in and complete the full treatment. Um, that also includes the psychological um, intervention as well. So because sometimes if they know that uh, the Family Support Center, they know that they provide treatment for violence or all victims of violence, including sexual violence, but um, finance can be one of the endurance uh, that can stop them from accessing treatment. So transport reimbursement, we have seen an increased number in follow-up uh, treatment, especially for the uh, sexual violence survivors. Um, in addition, we have also uh, done um, the PEP, the post-exposure prophylaxis prescriber training. Uh, uh, the PEP treatment is for the HIV PEP, uh, for the health workers uh, from primary health care facilities uh, to ensure that the post-rape medication is available and it's given um, timely to the victims. And for the third question, um, an example of one of the work that we do with a specific community. Uh, in one of the provinces that we've been working in, we will work closely with village birth attendants, like I've stated, um, for them to provide awareness in the community on violence and sexual violence. Um, they mostly conduct awareness on the psychological and psychosocial effects of violence and sexual violence. Um, they provide information on the available services and the importance of seeking timely psychological and medical support. They also provide support to victims at the community level and refer them to relevant services. Um, in addition, uh, as mentioned, I, they also provide or conduct support group sessions in the communities for people affected by violence and sexual violence. So that's an example of what we do. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Vina. Thank you very much, Rebecca. That was so useful and so important to hear of all those uh, work that you're doing in uh, PNG. Uh, so we have heard from our practitioners. Uh, and now um, I'd like to bring my colleague Kirsten in to talk about research and how we are thinking about sexual violence in academia um, in, and also in terms of our uh, research. So Kirsten Ainley is Associate Professor in the Department of International Relations in the Coral Bell School and Deputy Principal Investigator at the GCRF Gender Justice and Security Hub at LSE. Kirsten's research focuses on international policy and practice in military, legal and development focused interventions and the impacts of these interventions. She has published widely on international criminal law transitional justice, the International Criminal Court, and the responsibility to protect. Kirsten's current work focuses on methods of evaluating the gendered impacts of transitional justice programs. Kirsten, we are honored to have you. So like May and Rebecca, I also have three questions for you. Actually, maybe again, a set of questions, uh, perhaps more than three. So the questions are, how do researchers conceptualize sexual violence? Do other forms of gender-based violence increase as a result of conflict affecting a community? Survivors often mention that effective justice is the justice that is right for them. What does justice look like? Finally, what roles can research play in supporting survivors to seek justice and enable their access to vital services? Over to you, Kirsten. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation, Bina. Thank you to Tony and to David for hosting the event. It's a real privilege to be speaking alongside Rebecca and May on this topic and on this day. So I'm here in part, as Bina mentioned, because of my role in a major research consortium um, on gender justice and security, which is led by Professor Christine Chinkin, who is one of the innovators in this field and based at the Centre for Women, Peace and Security at LSE. 
The hub's a consortium of more than 40 institutions with nearly 150 researchers and staff who are working on a range of projects with the overall aim of accelerating progress towards gender justice and inclusive security in conflict affected societies. And I mention this both because I think the work that the researchers on the hub are doing is brilliant, but also because I'm going to draw on their work uh, when I speak and I'll draw more broadly on the field too. And I'm not going to be able to reference all of the work um, by the name of the academics. So please follow up with me if you'd like any more details of any of the research that I mention. I'm going to mention quite a lot and it's certainly not all mine. This is a very rich field uh, and indeed the event is being moderated today by one of the leading voices in the field, Bina de Costa. So Bina, your first question, which was two questions. I like the style of this, I must say. <laughs> you squeezed in five, I think, in my three questions. Um, so how do researchers conceptualize sexual violence? And I think the first thing I wanted to say on this was I'm not sure that researchers are much use alone. I think we're most effective when we're working in collaboration with survivors, with activists, with humanitarian organizations, sometimes with lawyers. And something important I'd like to acknowledge at the beginning here is a recent blog post by a colleague, Sala Arusi, um, who I'm working with a project on arts-based approaches to violence and peace. And Sala writes about the survivor researcher, reminding us that many people who are working in this field are some combination of survivor researcher and activist. So in partnership with other forms of research and advocacy, I think academic research on sexual violence has led to three useful conceptualizations or perhaps reconceptualizations of violence in this field. So first, it's highlighted the costs of a focus on rape and sexual violence in war. So while it often renders this focus on, on rape and sexual violence focuses our attention on something which has long been ignored, it can also render women who are often the victims of this violence as weak or vulnerable or objects of protection instead of as powerful political agents. And so some of the most recent research has been arguing that this can lead to too great a focus on the protection arm of the women, peace and security agenda and not on the participation arm, which I'll say something a little bit more about later. Researchers have also challenged the way that a focus on rape and war can hide rather than illuminate the links between conflict-related sexual violence and other forms of either not so obviously sexual violence in conflict, like torture, and sexual violence outside conflict. And it's shown there's a, a continuum of violence against women, that gendered structures and political, and economic and cultural inequalities in peacetime enable and are linked to sexual violence in conflict. So it's brought our attention to the many forms of gendered threats that are faced by women post-conflict, and some of these have been mentioned already, but these might include th uh, things like rape threats in women's workers, activists or human rights defenders, sexual bribery when widows ne negotiate local bureaucracies as heads of households, sexual violence in IDP camps or during migration attempts. All threats that aren't sexual but happen because of gender, things like the denial of land title to war widows. And this violence is often structural and it's widespread or systematic. It can't be explained away as a result of bad apples and the armed forces carrying out individual attacks. And so the, the contribution of this research, I think, is to draw our attention to structural and socioeconomic root causes of sexual and gender based violence. And May has mentioned the importance of looking at root causes already. And it suggests that to confront this form of violence, we need to confront discrimination based on gender and to confront unequal structures and practices in a wider range of fields that we need to link security policy and protection work to a much more broader uh, fundamental agenda about gender equality and about human rights. And then I think academic research has also called attention to other forms and victims of sexual violence. And again, this is building on things that May and Rebecca have already said. So feminist activists um, called for um, more attention to be given uh, to sexual violence against women and got this on the international agenda. But initially, at least, this was at the expense of acknowledging that women and girls aren't the only people who are attacked in this way and that a focus on men raping women blinds us to some of the dynamics of sexual violence. So the latest research problematizes conceptions of wartime sexual violence that focus on sexed bodies where males as perpetrators, females as victims, not to de-centre 
women as victims and the importance of understanding and um, and supporting women who have been survivors of this violence. But to say that there are features of society which render this violence possible, which we don't see by focusing in very particular ways on sexual violence rather than sexual and gender based violence. So it looks beyond the gender binary to explore, for instance, the ways that LGBTQI and trans people are made vulnerable to specific forms of, gen of sexual and gender based violence. And also at toxic forms of masculinity that create and sustain layers of gendered power and dominance, which bleed between war and peace. And I think both of those two latter sets of work, um, they suggest that there are multiple forms of gender and gender based and sexual violence that are present in war and peacetime and the existence of background conditions of inequality and discrimination facilitate them all. So your second question was about justice. Given this backdrop, what might justice look like? What is effective justice? Um, and survivors often mention, you, you, um, you note in your question that justice is the right thing for them. Well, I think this is really difficult territory. So on the one hand, it's tempting to respond that justice is whatever survivors want. But justice means many things to survivors of sexual violence and sexual and gender based violence. For some, it's about prosecution, the punishment or imprisonment of offenders, sometimes about their, the perpetrator of the violence against them rather than a commander or a more senior leader who courts often target. It could be about reparation and repair at the individual or community level. It might mean access to health care, to mental health and psychosocial services, to legal aid, to protection services. Um, justice might be a seeking of truth. Uh, it might be a desire for a public acknowledgement of what's happened. And it might be read as um, applying to other people, not those who are attacked, but for instance, children born of war. So survivors may want to see the stigma around children lifted and for them to gain some form of social acceptance and stable identity rather than wanting a particular justice outcome for themselves as survivors. So there's no one understanding of justice that emerges from listening to survivors, though they absolutely should be listened to and listened to very early in the planning process of justice responses. Because they're clearly the most important stakeholder group, um, but because of the variety of forms of sexual violence and the variety of um, conditions that survivors are in, there isn't one set of justice responses. Now, I think one of the things you can do to sort of sort through some of this is to think about different notions of justice. So retributive justice focuses on punishing rule breaking. This is the kind of criminal justice that we're all familiar with. Uh, restorative justice is less concerned with rule breaking and more concerned with how do you put a situation right when people or relationships have been harmed and it might focus on who's been hurt on what their needs are and again this is something that I say I see um, are doing an enormous amount of work on and maybe who has the obligation to meet those needs which may or may not include the original perpetrators of the harm. And so you may then think about programs of reparation about truth and reconciliation commissions and so on rather than trials. And there's a new idea of justice, um, which is emerging, that justice should be about transformation. A much more ambitious conception of justice that, um, as Bina well knows, is gaining currency within the transitional justice field and is being talked about around justice for sexual violence too. And it concerns the ways that social structures and institutions enable harms, as I talked about earlier, and how those structures and institutions might be transformed to prevent such harms in future. And this kind of justice program is looking to overcome oppression, to build long term context specific processes which transform the underlying inequalities and in power structures that underline sexual, uh, underlie sexual and gender based violence and lead to empowerment. And UN Women has been promoting transformative rep reparations that, in, that do address individual violations, but they also address deep lying uh, inequalities. And that might include aspects of justice that we don't usually think about when we're thinking about justice for sexual violence survivors. So it might be access to land and inheritance rights for the wives of the disappeared, or to land restitution and redistribution, to access to credit and to income generating skills, as well as services like trauma support, fistula surgeries, and so on. But while this sounds great, and there are many people who are very supportive of an idea of transformative justice, it's very abstract, it's quite removed, it's deeply susceptible to politicization, and it's kind of land of empty promises. So when we look around the world and ask, are there states who have managed to remove these structural inequalities to transform discriminatory structures, even if they're not having to deal 
with post-conflict, post-colonial challenges, there are very few states which we regard as being successful in this way. So it's difficult to believe that often temporary, often under-resourced um, efforts at transitional justice are going to be able to bring about these kind of great changes. And I think that you certainly meet survivors who are very skeptical of this kind of approach who think it's a great idea in theory very unlikely to happen in practice and may therefore actually just want to get justice that's closer to home so another thing we could do i'm just keeping an eye on the time is to look at the record of different forms of justice post-conflict to determine what effective justice might be i think the records here aren't particularly laudatory so international and hybrid courts have been innovative in defining offenses of sexual violence and we've heard already from May uh, on this, we've got the various of the hybrid courts uh, in Sierra Leone, courts of Cambodia have recognized forced marriage um, as a crime against humanity. So there've been real developments in understanding the nature of sexual violence and what kind of a crime sexual violence is rather than a attack on or a low level war crime, very serious sustained attacks against civilian populations with um, rape being uh, identified at least in the um, International Criminal Tribunal um, uh, for Yugoslavia and Rwanda statutes and later implied at the ICC that rape uh, can also be a form of genocide. So there's been a recognition of the seriousness um, of sexual violence within conflict and of the importance of attempting to prosecute it, but very, very few prosecutions of sexual violence have taken place at the international level. Um, We've also seen there's interesting studies around when you have a gender inclusive process, as for instance in Sierra Leone, with women holding key roles in the court, um, and innovative jurisprudence on sexual violence, and that, which then leads to a discourse, or at least can be argued to lead to a discourse in society, which brings about progressive gender laws. Actually, there's um, work by people like Valerie Ustervel that suggests that it didn't transform the situation of sexual violence in the country in Sierra Leone, that domestic violence, intimate partner violence, other forms of gender violence continue. So you have this great investment in some form of criminal accountability for sexual violence in wartime that doesn't then translate across to the experiences of people in peacetime. And I think now there's a, there's a very deep distrust, and I'm happy to say more about this in the Q&A because I'm running low on time. It's a deep distrust of international interventions and institutions after the acquittal of uh, Jean-Pierre Benbogombo at the International C uh, Criminal Court. Um, so he was convicted, uh, it was the first conviction that the ICC made for rape and his conviction was overturned. And it's a complicated and I think really distressing story about what that seems to allow military commanders now to do. It gives them a lot of leeway um, uh, in terms of, of what, they, what their responsibilities as commanders are. So I think it's very hard to define effective justice, um, but I think we can see quite clearly what it isn't, um, that despite some of the best attempts at, at criminal justice for sexual violence, um, there's been a real failure in the field, um, which we need to do as, as researchers much more to address and understand in getting to, um, to prosecution. Um, and your final question is about uh, the role that research can play in supporting survivors to seek justice and to enable access to services. So I'd be really interested to hear what Rebecca may have to say on this, actually. I'm not sure that, again, academics can do much alone, but I think there's so much that we can do when we work collaboratively with survivors, with civil society organisations, with humanitarian organisations. So research can do things like it can show which policies work for who and in which circumstances. It can establish links between particular laws or policies and actual observed outcomes. And as researchers, we can echo and amplify the voices of survivors by telling their stories in their words, which can go some ways towards validating their experiences by presenting them as parts of broader patterns of violence in conflict. We can also broaden out conceptions of who's a survivor and how they've been affected, giving evidence to support the widening out of services. But I think academics can do something else too. They can reflect on the impact of changing the focus in policy work. So for instance, establishing the relationships between increased female political participation, what that does to stabilize peace processes and post-conflict societies, can show how wider gender equality goals can benefit whole societies, as well as reducing sexual and gender-based violence in times of conflict and peace. And then finally, I think research can help to facilitate and resource civil society and policy initiatives, like training, so again, this is something that's come up already, Training women and people from marginalised identity groups, also in including community leaders or youth leaders or teachers or police, 
um, in advocacy, in mediation, in political participation, in leadership, so they can participate in community initiatives, influence policy, change society. And it can show, research can show the ways in which survivors do already participate in the transformation of their societies. And so reclaim some of the power and the agency that sexual violence and some of the responses to it can remove. So I will leave it there, thank you. Thank you so much, Kirsten. Thanks. Um, it's incredibly rich insight from you about the role of justice and what you mentioned that uh, even the languages of transformative justice or effective justice, not necessarily, they don't always capture what we want to uh, actually measure or is it really measurable the way we think about it. So it has to be context specific. The other point that you mentioned about the role of research uh, and here you uh, highlighted the, our collaboration, how that's important with practitioners, with policymakers, uh, and it's continuing this kind of collaboration. Uh, so this is what this is a wonderful opportunity for ICRC and Bell School to showcase that kind of collaboration that we have in this space. So I will now open it up for uh, Q and A. And if you have a question for our uh, distinguished panelists, please can you type it on the chat function? And my friend from ICRC, Pat, will then read it out for us. Um, I have two questions from our uh, expert members. So the first one, I would like to invite Dr. Maria Taniag, my colleague at the Bell School, who is also an expert in the area of uh, sexual and gender-based violence, particularly in terms of her work in disasters in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, Maria, over to you. Thank you, Bina. Um, my question um, is for Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca, for your um, excellent talk and, and for really bringing to our attention the dual invisibility of mental health, especially for survivors of another invisible form of harm, which is sexual violence. My question to you is, um, as a humanitarian worker, um, tackling a very difficult and sensitive issue, especially in PNG, what do other humanitarian workers, um, such as yourself, need to be mindful of when working on mental health and psychosocial support for victims? Thank you. Rebecca? Okay, thank you. Um, as a humanitarian worker working with, um, working in, with this type of with the affected communities on this sensitive issue of uh, sexual violence. Um, there are a couple of things that I have to be mindful of. Um, I think uh, survivors stigmat stigmatization is one of them. So instead of um, ICRC doing it, um, it's always good that um, we train the community people, like for example, um, the village bed attendants. So we train them to identify and refer the victims or victims of violence and especially victims of sexual violence uh, instead of the ICRC or uh, doing it. Um, the other one, the next one or the important one is um, the cultural dynamics at play. Um, it's the importance of to tell them the importance of receiving timely and medical psychological treatment. And then um, the compensation can come afterwards. Um, normally in the islands, there's this compensation um, thing that they do here related to sexual violence, um, so survivors or victims of sexual violence. And um, most of the times, um, the victim's family and the perpetrator's family, they're interested in getting the compensation and more often um, the victims, the sexual violence victims um, needs are often neglected. So that is one of that, and um, which we have to be mindful and you know to tell them the importance of receiving the timely treatment for the survivors. And the third one is to to when we are doing the awareness and talking to communities on the topic of sexual violence, um, we have to clearly communicate it in an open manner so that they understand the importance and how it affects. Um, people, both psychologically and um, that, and it is important that they receive treatment timely. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. 
Um, I'd like to call my uh, colleague, Dr. Lauren Richardson. Now, uh, Lauren is my colleague at the Department of International Relations. Her work focuses on non-state actors uh, and diplo diplomatic interactions in Northeast Asia, particularly the politics of redress. Over to you, Lauren. Uh, thanks very much, Bina, and thanks to all the speakers for a wonderful panel. Um, most of my research in this area has focused on the so-called comfort women redress movement. And I'm particularly interested um, in how, you know, we can prevent victims from being, or survivors from being re-victimized by politics. I see that a lot. Uh, I guess my question will go to Professor Kirsten Ainley, my colleague. Um, you mentioned that it's really important that there are many types of um, justice or many conceptions of justice among survivors and I see that with the former comfort women um, but I also see that as being in conflict with their advocates um, and the redress movement which in order to make a big movement you know you have to come up with a very clear narrative of victimization and very clear standards for justice um, and often when the survivors are willing to accept less in terms of justice from the Japanese government the advocates see that as, as kind of undermining their cause you know when the advocates are saying that nothing less than state compensation will suffice and the victims putting their hands up to you know offers that are less than that and then becoming, you know, victimized when they get pushed out of the movement. So I'm wondering how on a practical level we can really, you know, have a more individualized or survivor based approach to redress and justice. Bina, would you like me to say something brief on that now? Over to you, Kristen. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lauren. I think you're hitting on an incredibly important dynamic in the field and it's not one I think that there are easy answers to, but it's one we have to keep working with. So in my experience at um, observing international courts, I've seen this a lot. So there is a, um, within international criminal law at least, it's relatively new that victims are represented within trials and it's been relatively new that victims um, groups and groups of survivors and of course um, victims and survivors identify themselves differently so some do identify as victims and some as survivors and so I will use the terms interchangeably um, but it's been relatively new that groups of survivors have been consulted as to what they want because there's a there's a previously a kind of idea that justice was something out there we all knew what it was it could be brought to these situations that would mean the same thing and thank goodness we've moved beyond that and started to be much more context specific but there is a big push to agglomerate the interests of survivors and to form them into something which is tangible, um, which could be achieved by the courts. And I think it silences people again. So I saw this a lot in, um, in Cambodia in the ECCC that this, the survivors were pushed into being represented um, by a small number of lawyers. And the they had to negotiate then as to what their individual demands were. And I, it was, if you are using a, a criminal justice process, for a start, there is a certain amount of controversy as to what role victims should have in that process, because the process runs by different kinds of rules. So they might be represented and be able to speak and may act as victim witnesses, um, but may not be able to make determinations as to the outcomes. Um, but if you're using those kind of processes, it's difficult to get in any kind of individual redress. Better would be menus of options. And I think just to come back to what May said right at the beginning, I think one of the most effective things I've seen, but again is controversial, is handing out money. Handing out money for people to use because these survivors are agents that get denied agency. If you give them money and say, why don't you go decide what you need? Maybe that not everything is, is purchasable as a form of justice, but it seems to me that there's the most, the most interesting approach to this question I've seen for a long time. It's this, the ICRC's response, which is not just in the area of sexual violence, as I understand it, but more broadly, to say, let's treat survivors as agents in their own recovery, make a set of, um, of services available and then have them decide what they want to access as far as possible. So no big answers, but I think that's a really um, progressive move. Thank you, Kristen. Um, Pat, I would like to pass this over to you to just tell me if in chat uh, function, I can see there are many, many, many comments and questions there. 
and quite a few have also come to me personally. But Pat, I'll pass it over to you first to see uh, if you could pick a uh, few questions from there for us. Thank you. Sure thing. Um, first of all, thank you very much to our wonderful panel. So the first question that I've picked up here from the chat is from Maria Alonso. So she's just asking the panel if they can speak a little bit more um, about this issue as it relates to displaced persons uh, and migrants uh, in particular who are victims of sexual or gender-based violence, um, kind of just with the assumption that the level of protection is not the same in terms of transnational prosecutions as well as access to justice. So yeah, just would the panel, uh, anyone really be kind of happy to speak a little bit to that particular aspect of this issue a little bit more? Uh, and do you want me to go through a couple more questions, Bina, or just start with that one? Yes. And the next question that jumped out at me was from Anton, Anton Churchyard. So to all three speakers, given the lack of prosecutions of offenders in relation to gender-based and sexual violence in conflict situations, does this mean that international humanitarian law is inadequate in protecting victims of such violence? And if so, should additional legal protections be considered? So that's a bit of a tough IHL one for the team there. Um, and the next one that I'll, the last one I'll list just for now is from AB in the chat. Uh, for the speakers, is sexual violence historically uh, increasing or is there a growing propensity for victims or survivors to come forward? And what might the main factors driving that change be? Um, many thanks, cheers. Thank you, Pat. Uh, over to our panelists. Um, maybe I could ask uh, May to go first again. Uh, May, if you'd like to pick up something from there. Sure, um, maybe just first on the displacement and migration um, question. Um, and I might leave some of that. I think some of it might have been related to, to some of Kirsten's interventions. But just to, to comment that, you know, co conflict and, um, you know, situations of violence do, do lead to mass internal and, and trans-border trans displacements. And um, what we see from evidence across the humanitarian community is of course that where there is a decrease in sort of the availability of stable services, where there's a decrease in a lot of the social networks and, and social kind of protections that might have been there to either address um, or prevent sexual violence, these, these fall away in a situation of, of migration. And indeed the causes of migration can sometimes be very deeply related to um, you know, the, the conduct of, of, of war crimes in their many forms, including sometimes sexual violence. So we do see that there is um, deep interlinkages here. And we also see that um, the humanitarian community has evidence that people who are displaced face some of the highest levels um, of sexual and gender-based violence on route and, and in locations due to a lot of these factors around services, social protections, um, housing changing, the uncertainty of precariousness of the situation. Um, and indeed, um, you know, that there are particular risks and so partnership with um, communities is a key way that, that we manage that on community-based protection mapping um, and, and identifying response options. But also, there is a lot of great work, of course, in, 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 in terms of uh, where organisations have the capacity to, to provide information about risks um, in journeys and provide information about services that are in different destinations, while not taking a position on, you know, migration itself in, in a particular context. These sorts of things can be very helpful um, for, for addressing um, risks and for, for addressing the response side. On the lack of prosecution related to um, sexual violence in conflict uh, using IHL, this is an interesting, you know, question. There, there are always two aspects to a law, you know, or any body of law. If you think of a body of law as a circle and you draw a line down the middle, part of it is about the the response side and, um, you know, implementing the the sticks if people disobey those. Um, laws and part of it is setting a, a norm, setting a, a new standard uh, to prevent things from happening before they occur. And so IHL of course um, serves this purpose to, to, to moderate the laws of war writ 
writ large. And, um, you know, just because one body of law is not always used to prosecute um, some of these crimes, it doesn't mean that they're any less effective in serving their overall purpose. And I would add that those complementary bodies of law add protection. Um, and for these reasons, we really do, as an ICRC, highlight the importance of states internalizing and making it clear in their domestic laws and their domestic frameworks um, these rules around IHL and indeed for state armed forces to also make these rules um, clear in their codes of conduct for the prevention side. Um, and I'm, I'm sure David may have more on that and, and also Rebecca. And the question of whether um, it's increasing or decreasing the, the, the use of sexual violence in, in, in conflict. This is extremely, um, uh, you know, challenging to, to, to know over time. What we know is that historically sexual violence has been uh, a key facet of, of, of warfare. And we know that it's also incredibly hard to measure. And we know that there are, um, for various reasons, invisible aspects to, to this. And what is important from, from our perspective is um, ensuring adequate response for survivors wheresoever they are and adequate frameworks for preventing it from happening in the first place. But for those of you who are interested and it shows what's sitting on my desk, I don't endorse this, I have nothing to do with this book, but those of you who are interested might be interested in Christina Lamb's new book, Our Bodies, Their Battlefield, um, which is trying to track um, uh, trends in this regard. And I think there's another important aspect to this, which is um, sexual exploitation and abuse um, and what is being uncovered um, in work with survivors and, and with academics around the scale of sexual exploitation and abuse um, in, in the modern world of, of humanitarian interventions. So those are just some quick reflections on those questions. Over to you, Bina. Great, thank you, uh, May. Uh, so Rebecca, I'll just come to you if you want to respond something, but maybe a bit briefly for now, my panelists, because uh, we are actually running over time as I speak. So Rebecca, over to you. Should I uh, pass it on to Kristen first, Rebecca? Oh, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, just with the difficulty in uh, post victims of um, violence accessing um, legal services and all this, um, it's in PNG context. Um, I think it's quite difficult with the funding and all that. Um, and also most of these uh, victims, um, they really don't um, finish the end of like the complete um, access to services, um, especially with the legal side. So, yeah, that's about it. Thank you, Rebecca. Kirsten, uh, over to you now. Let me say something very brief. Um, so the first thing I would do is recommend to you um, on migration and uh, sexual violence, a piece written by my colleague on the research hub, Paul Kirby, which has been published recently on the EU's treatment of migrants uh, in migrant camps in Libya, which is a really interesting exploration of the EU, which claims to uh, stand uh, steadfastly against sexual violence and, um, and what's hard to prevent it actually allowing for quite widespread uh, sexual violence within um, uh, migrant detention camps. So I recommend that strongly because it explores a lot of these issues in great depth. Um, and then also on law, I think we've got enough law. Um, and I think, that, I think the, the transformation in international criminal law um, and in other spheres of law and human rights law is a triumph of feminist advocacy in the last 20 30 years but there are there are problems with the implementation of the law um, and i would recommend that someone like uh, rosemary gray's work who's an, a, a 
I published a book a couple of years ago about prosecuting sexual and gender-based violence at the International Criminal Courts. So much of the time, we've got frameworks. We've got CEDAW, we've got um, human rights frameworks, we've got international criminal legal frameworks, but something isn't working. It's not translating from the formal bodies of law through the political implementation systems and the legal implementation system to offer protection and to confront the root causes. So there's lots to be done there, but it feels to me like it probably isn't reforming the law. It's looking at these other levels of implementation. And I'll leave it there. Thank you again for the invitation. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, Pat, uh, is there any burning question that you must ask from the chat or should I? Maybe just one more, just in case anyone wants, is particularly keen to answer it. So it, this is a question in the chat from Luna about essentially uh, data, the question of data collection as it pertains to sexual and gender-based violence in, confl in conflict settings. Um, so maybe just to boil the question down uh, to the core of it, it's asking what are some of the key actions that ICRC and other civil society actors, researchers and respondents can take to strengthen data collection in order to respond to this unending crisis of um, SGBV, um, to provide access to justice and ultimately to prevent SGB, uh, uh, SGBV in conflict settings. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Pat. Uh, maybe this is also a good time to ask our panelists to offer their wrap-up uh, comments. So perhaps uh, one or one and a half minute each. So this time I'll start with Kirsten. Kirsten, over to you. Um, I haven't got much to say with the wrap-up apart from what a privilege it's been to talk through this and I hope we can continue um, these conversations. I think there's so many interesting questions that we haven't had a chance to get to and I'm not going to even attempt to start to answer them now but thank you very much for the audience for your engagement as well um, and just to, um, to pay respect to the enormous amount of work that's being done by so many agencies in so many areas with so many survivors um, of this appalling form of violence um it strikes me as a um a topic which has been really critical to talk through and i've learned a lot from being able to participate today so thank you thank you Kristen. rebecca your one minute please thank you bina and thank you everyone for the opportunity to be part of this panel discussion um, and especially for <clears throat> putting the islands um to be highlighted in this uh, discussion. Um, obviously, the issue of sexual violence is um, very relevant here in the islands and it's widespread. So there's actually a need for more support and funding here for the work that we do. And thank you very much, Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> May, over to you. Yes, I can only echo my, my thanks and, and gratitude for being uh, having been invited to be part of this panel and for having the privilege to, to listen in particular to Rebecca's fantastic work. Um, I would say that it's the kickoff today of the 16 days of activism against sexual and gender-based violence. And so I'd implore everyone on the line to continue um, with these 16 days by turning your minds to these great questions in the in the, in, the, in the box here, um, many of which we didn't get a chance to answer, but that are incredibly important. So keep, keep, keep up the action, keep up the activity, and thanks, Bina.